What is going on with Mark Cuban and the generic drugs? So as I as mentioned at the onset, you know, brand drugs are wildly overinflated, uh, at least the sticker prices relative to their, their net cost to a payer. Well, the same is true on generic drugs. And in fact, the disparity between the list prices and the real prices are even greater. Hello, hello, and thank you so much for joining another episode of The Disruptive Front. Today, I have an amazing guest, Antonio Chacha. Antonio is the Chief Strategy Officer for Three Access Advisors, the CEO at 46 Brook Brooklyn Research, and the Senior Advisor at APHA. Antonio, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be with you, Scott. Well, we've actually, uh, we've had uh, shows and we've done a lot of, dia uh, had a lot of dialogue on, on the subjects we're going to get into, but uh, I feel the fire on your side. I see your tweets. I see your posts. And one thing I can say is I commend you for your work, not only in just pharmacy, uh, but also in healthcare as a whole and, and for the communities, you know, people are losing out and um, a lot of, uh, a lot of transparency is not frequently seen in healthcare. And you do a good job of uncovering a lot of what's happening and you do a good job of creating that volume for others to also be a voice. So thank you so much for what you do. Um, I want to start actually by getting into some of the things like drug inflation, uh, the artificial inflated drug prices. So talk to me, talk to everybody. What does that mean? And what are we seeing in that area? So uh, over the last few years, we've seen uh, a kind of a downward trend in the number of price increases that occur uh, throughout the course of the year. Traditionally though, the month of January is when most of the price increases occur. And so it tends to be a bellwether for what we see for the rest of the year. And so since 2015, we've seen a, an erosion in both the number of price increases and the degree of those increases over time. However, 2021 looks like it's about to change course. Um, as I said, most brand name drug price increases occur at the first of the year. And looking backwards, this January had the most price increases in a decade. Now, while those numbers say, wow, oh my God, like we're more price increases than ever before, the degree of those increases are the lowest point than they've, than they've been in a decade either. So more drugs going up in price, but of those price increases that occurred, it was to a lesser degree than what we've historically seen. Why are we, I feel like we're so um, uh, comfortable with hearing about this dialogue. You know, we hear drug prices increase and blah, 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 blah. And it seems normal, like, you know, uh, like, like food and water almost. It, it feels like we should just live with it. So why, why are we so comfortable with that? I don't understand. Um, one word, uh, or I guess you could say a couple letters that you love. I know that you just think about this night and day, uh, PBMs. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your favorite what is stopping the major probes from happening into PBMs? And how do you see your personal opinion? How do you see us fixing the issue now? So, you know, most people don't, don't know uh, what a PBM is. I could barely spell it a few years ago. And uh, you know, PBMs are middlemen that act on behalf of insurers uh, to ultimately administer pharmacy benefits on behalf of patients and plan sponsors. Uh, PBMs, and this goes back to our conversation about drug prices, you know, while list prices for prescription drugs are going up, there's a, a lot of data out there that actually shows that drug makers are willing to give big concessions on their drugs through the form of rebates and discounts. And those rebates and discounts flow to state Medicaid programs, but also to PBMs. And so drug makers, in order to get their drugs covered by PBMs, they need to ultimately entice the PBM to cover that drug in the first place. So essentially it acts like, you know, when you go into a bar and you have to essentially pay the bouncer at the bar in order to get in, all right, it's going to act like a tax for you on your way through the door. So drug makers are having to pay the tax to get their drugs covered. Well, the problem is, is that tax or those rebates are growing significantly year over year. Well, what that does is it creates upward pressure on prices because now rather than drug makers competing in an open transparent marketplace, where they're competing against other like drug makers to entice coverage, well, instead of lowering their prices, they're raising them and then discounting them more and more over time. So we have a broken system that 
competition is not lowering prices. It's actually inflating them. You know, it seems very shady, um, you know, and, and I think it, it, I hate to say it in that fashion, but it, it does seem shady. And especially when we don't have a, a means to account for the value that those drugs are even causing to begin with. You know, we saw pay for performance models uh, try with um, um, uh, a, a Pil Pilgrim Health and Amgen. And, and we've seen this happen over and over and over that the attempt. I don't think until we get to that level, can we actually say why, and this is going to continue to happen, but also I, I have to say there are some bad players and, and I would ask, who are the bad players? Is it legislators? Is it, you know, it's, is it your independent pharmacies? I know the rhetorical question to that or the rhetorical answer there. And uh, so who are the bad players in the system? Who, who do we need to watch out for? And how do we, how do we go about that? Well, so uh, ultimately, if I was to say, who's the worst player, uh, it's Congress. They haven't done anything to realign this system in a way that removes the incentives for higher prices. We know that more and more patients are being exposed to unnecessary uh, list price, unnecessary costs from list prices. We know that the number of drugs that are being covered by PBMs is declining over time. We're seeing more and more formulary exclusions. So higher prices, more out-of-pocket expenses, less pharmacy access, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, so Congress has is ultimately the ones who can reset the incentives and encourage lower drug prices. But instead, they have tethered themselves to a system that encourages this type of behavior. Um, and so what you have is a, an entire drug supply chain that is now feeding and relying on these artificially inflated prices. It's not just drug makers. It's not just wholesalers. It's not just pharmacies. It's not just PBMs and it's not just insurance companies. It's the entire top to bottom drug supply chain that is reliant on these overinflated sticker prices. And somebody has to come in and pull the rug out from under it. That can only be done through system redesign, which Congress has the ability to do. Well, I, I definitely hate to say it, but I feel like Congress many times is always like the uh, group that's like, hey, we're really busy right now. But like, that's your job to stay busy. Like, that's not going to change. So uh, it, it does become a little um, repetitive and, and it feels like a burnout almost when you try to be part of that policy change as well. Um, you know, we won't get into any of the companies right now, but I, I want to ask you, you know, a, a, about a year and a half ago, I proposed a bill in uh, that was proposed, well, passed in Colorado for capping copay of insulin. I proposed that in Florida. And the response that I got from a lot of uh, members of the House and Senate in Florida were that, we're waiting on Canadian importation that's going to fix the problem. Don't worry about it. Even though the bill excluded injectables, which was like, that's the entire point of the bill here is to help with an injectable. So talk to me, is that, is, is that the silver lining, Canadian importation? Is that it? Are we going to win with that one? Well, unfortunately, you know, look, for better or worse, Canada has lower list prices than the United States. Um, we're in the middle of doing an analysis of Canadian drug prices uh, to America. We've already done analyses at over at 46 Brooklyn where we've anal analyzed American drug prices versus Australian prices. And big surprise, you know, every you know, country is essentially paying lower prices for their prescription drugs than we are. But we are the only system that relies on these middlemen and rebates to negotiate, quote, lower prices. So some people think, look, maybe what, our solu what the American solution is, is do what other countries do, which is have a single government negotiated formulary where they essentially you know, are, are price controlling the drugs. Um, I think there are good reasons not to do that, but this current system is not necessarily working in its own autopilot either. So if you were actually to compare post rebate prices, so what drug makers are required to offer state Medicaid programs, they're very close to in line with Canadian and Australian drug prices, but there are trade-offs with all of that. So it's not as simple as just import drugs from other countries because those are materially different systems. Part of the issue that you will have is, let's just say we pass something today that said, we're gonna import drugs from XYZ company or country that has really, really low sticker prices. Pharmacies are now being paid based off of derivatives off those sticker prices. So now pharmacies will actually be disincentivized from purchasing those drugs because it will materially impact their reimbursements from PBMs. So again, back to what I was saying, this entire supply chain 
is feeding off of these artificially very American drug prices. And it takes a system-wide fix to unwind that. It's not as simple as this state will just import their drugs from Canada now. Nobody will want to buy them. Right. And, and I think that's the problem is that we always rely on clean water and clean air as you know communities as well. So we hear about these talking points per se. And then just people are like, well, there's a solution coming. We'll all kind of wait around and, ha- and you know, have that happen. Um, I, I, I do want to talk about independent pharmacies for a second. You know, we've been talking about provider status for a long time. We've been talking about, you know, PBMs as well and uh, the lack of rebate uh, or, or help in terms of resources for independence when it comes to the PBMs involvement. Do you think that the coronavirus vaccine is sh- shining a light on the independent pharmacies? And, I, and and that's part of my question. And then how will business models change? Uh, will you, do you think that moving forward, independent pharmacies are solely going to be focused on these type of things when, when it comes to public health versus just dispensing to show that proof of concept? Uh, I just wanted to get your opinion on both of those. Well, I think it goes without saying pharmacists as, 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 a, as a profession provide a tremendous amount of value to the overall healthcare delivery system. I think prior to this pandemic, I think the general public kind of took for granted that it was just basically a place where you can obtain your medications. And whilst many people have good, meaningful uh, relationships with their pharmacists, and those pharmacists are doing a a number of things to help influence better outcomes for those patients, we, I, I think as society, have largely taken it for granted. And we've also taken for granted the importance of diversity within the pharmacy marketplace, a, a, a wide array of, of options for a patient, a place where you can go and get your medications very conveniently and get a gallon of milk and some M&Ms on your way out the door, or a pharmacy that is actively working to manage your overall chronic disease states. Um, look, some younger people who don't have complicated disease states, they may not need that personalized care, at least now, but a lot of older Americans really need that personalized touch that many independent pharmacies provide. And so I think that we as a society should, should want and strive for a diverse marketplace of pharmacies that provide different types of services, not just convenience, but also clinical. Um, I think the COVID pandemic has really uh, shown a spotlight on the importance of, uh, of a diversity of access points for pharmacy, not just for the dispensation of drugs, but you know, vaccines as we now know, as well as testing. Uh, but what we've seen is that many states are moving way further. I mean, when we're talking about testing, sure, that's kind of a newer thing for pharmacy, but vaccines, man, that, that's 20 years old. Um, it's just administering a different type of vaccine. What I'm interested in is what pharmacists can do to move the needle on overall chronic disease management, making a patient actually adherent and actually meeting their goals, uh, whether they have diabetes or hypertension or asthma or, or fill in the blank. Um, in the state of Ohio, where, where I'm from, you know, we now have laws in the books that allow pharmacists to order labs and prescribe medications for patients. So there are meaningful things that a pharmacist can do to influence a patient's outcome, not just to keep them out of the hospital, but to keep them out of a casket. So what we need to do is uh, incent that type of behavior through paying pharmacists for the value that they provide through their clinical services, which to me, um, while I like getting into the weeds on drug prices and PBMs and reimbursement, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, setups, what really I care about is how do we incent the, the services that a pharmacist can provide that really help drive home a better health outcome for patients? Well, you know, I, I, I see Ohio as well using things that uh, include technology, which I, I do believe it, it is the factor in all of this as well, because if you really want to be accountable, you have to show for data. You have to show for those points of contact, not just somebody walking into the pharmacy, you giving good information and they going home and that, you know, that never be collected. I think there has to be an engagement. Technology has to be, uh, you know, accountable for that. Um, you know, you have things like teledispensing as well in the state, uh, which some states like, some states don't, X, Y, Z. Uh, but I, I think it's important that we get to patients where they want to be because a lot of times they fall into this kind of, uh, which, hey, maybe not bad, but the online pharmacy where those in-person points of contact are lost. So I, I think the education is important. And, and going back to the independence real quick, they've also been a huge help in the education of communities, uh, especially communities that have 
been done over in the past or, um, you know, not trusting the healthcare system for very valid reasons. And, and I think that independent pharmacies have been a key source for educating uh, and, and being within community members uh, realm. I think that's so important. I want to jump over to a very interesting topic. Uh, Mark Cuban. So, wow, you know, from basketball to uh, generic drugs. So uh, I, I guess he's, he, he's uh, using his money wisely. So talk to me a little bit about this interesting topic. Everything we need to know real, real quick in an, in an envelope, what is going on with Mark Cuban and the generic drugs? So as I, as I mentioned at the onset, you know, brand drugs are wildly overinflated. Uh, at least the sticker prices relative to their, their net cost to a payer. The same is true on generic drugs. And in fact, the disparity between the list prices and the real prices are even greater. Uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, the average list price for a generic drug to be about, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the actual market clearing rate for pharmacies to acquire a drug are actually about 80 to 90% cheaper than what their sticker prices are. And so what, what Mark Cuban is doing is saying, look, we understand that prescription drugs are overinflated. We know many patients who have to pay out of pocket who are in high deductible plans are stuck paying some derivative of those artificially inflated list prices. What he's doing is he's looking at the marketplace to see where overinflated prices exist in the generic marketplace. And much like any generic manufacturer would do, come in maybe a little bit lower and undercut the market, thus providing value back to the overall system. Well, what's unique with what he's doing is that he's actually lowering the sticker price all the way down to what the actual rate is that he sells it out in the marketplace. That kind of disruption is going to have major ripple effects if it ever gets penetration uh, you know, beyond just a press release. And are you saying that more people can be part of this? Is, it, is this a trend that we should look forward to? What, what should we be watching out for? Uh, because I love disruption. Obviously, this is a disruptive front. So this is what it's all about. <laughs> yeah, so as I, back to our conversation about Canadian imports, okay? If pharmacies are paid based off some percentage off of the sticker price, well, let's just say I'm a pharmacy and I have a contract where the PBM says, I'm going to pay you at an aggregate discount to 85% off AWP for all the generic drugs. And AWP is the sticker price for the drugs. 85% off those sticker prices. Well, what happens if I go out and buy Mark Cuban's drugs, whose list prices are not overinflated relative to their acquisition cost? What that means is that I'm going to get an 85% hit off of my actual acquisition cost of that drug. So from a pharmacy standpoint, as long as you're being reimbursed by a PBM, buying those drugs would be the stupidest business decision you could ever make. Now, I think obviously, I'm sure Mark Cuban understands that dynamic, uh, which is why, you know, when I think these drugs come to market, I think everybody's going to be in for a little surprise that the drug supply chain that he's trying to penetrate is going to spit those drugs out and say, we didn't want them in the first place because we love those artificially inflated prices. Now, the benefit for the patient is that now they at least have somewhere where they can go pay, you know, a sticker price that matches the real price of that drug, which will be materially lower than the other available products in the marketplace. What I'm excited for is what happens when Mark Cuban's drugs start running up against the wall of the PBM industry and its reliance on artificially inflated prices. That's the war that I want to watch because well, that's where the disruption starts. I don't see Mark Cuban being exploited anytime soon. Um, and I think that's the big fear, right? With the pharmaceutical companies is if they don't say yes to those prices that were set by the PBMs, then they don't get put on in that network. They don't get the drug of choice in that formulary. So I, I do think that it's important uh, that we have more private citizens. You know, I, I'm so inspired by the private and uh, uh, government you know, connections as well, because you look at Medicaid, Medicare, the price setting that, that they want to put out. But I mean, look at things like space, you know, if, if it wasn't for Elon Musk, would really people be this excited right now in today's world about space and NASA? Would they be fueled the way they are? No pun intended, but would they be fueled the way they are in today's uh, market? I, I think it's awesome to see. I'm excited about the potential. I'm truly happy and commend you again for what you're doing. I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. Everybody, this is another episode of The Disruptive Front. Thank you so much for tuning in. Antonio, one question. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at 3axisadvisors.com, 46brooklyn.com, or on Twitter at A underscore Chacha. Follow this guy right here, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott.